Hello and welcome. Today I'm introducing to you Hamish Wilson. He is a GP and he's a medical educator at Otago Med School. So welcome, Hamish. Well, thanks, um, Mel, for coming along. I'm happy to chat with you and we'll talk, talk about whatever you like. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> well, I've been a practicing GP for 40 years now and I've always had an interest in patients with what you might call medically unexplained symptoms. And um, I have to say it's been hard to get our teaching organized here at Otago, but over the, the last 10 years, uh, we're starting to do that now. We're now we're now basing our teaching on the modern neurosciences and students seem to really like it because they see lots of these patients themselves. Seeing the whole person really um, in their context yeah. and trying to figure out what their symptoms are arising from. And so we're using a biopsychosocial model or a patient-centered clinical model. Uh, a number of people um, told me about the work you're doing and I'm certainly interested because for a lot of these patients, they don't do so well under the normal medical system. And, um, and yeah, certainly um, I've known a number of people who have, have gone through your program and done pretty well with it. So that's great. And um, I've got other colleagues um, down here who have also met with you. And, um, uh, you know, I think we we trotted you out at some point on during COVID. I think I interviewed you and we show that in interview to the students now and the and the whole person care module. Um, and um, that goes down well. Uh, we're trying to give students a range of perspectives on all these issues and uh, yours was very helpful. And we teach them about, you know, mind-body connection. So so that's all good, really. Yeah. Yeah, I, w I was thrilled when I came to Dunedin last week and saw the manual and saw what a range of mind-body and bio sort of psychosocial stuff is in there now. And saw you know the mentions to what are the concepts of the switch and how would you talk about this with people so that was very refreshing yeah. that it's, it's yeah um, yeah a no, discussion that's point i mean we're trying to teach students um to that number one these illnesses are legitimate ones just like any other mm -hmm. disease absolutely and if you give them a good explanation about what's happening they will yep. often improve we're not, yeah. there's, there's no branch of medicine where you get 100% cure. Well, I suppose if you take an appendix out, there's 100% cure, isn't it? But a, <laughs> a lot of these more chronic ones, you may not get 100%, but certainly you can improve people. And we're offering four um, explanatory models now, which is the somatization model, the pain neuroscience model, um, the sympathetic nervous system model, and the, and the lifestyle changes so mm. we're we're actively teaching those now to our medical students and as i say they they really enjoy it because in the past mm. they haven't had a lot of tools that they can do and they also mm. with due respect they're watching some of the older clinicians who don't have those tools at their disposal and they mm. don't really they aren't that fussed on that really to to feel and effective we're now mm. giving them some tools to feel more effective yeah when they see you in that video that's pretty early on in the piece they haven't got their own patients so um but when we give them the, the workshop the training workshop they, they really like that because it gives them a framework that they can frame up how these illnesses work and then a, a, a way of um you know some communication skills and explanatory models that they can actually use yeah. Um, it takes practice though I mean learning is through doing they have to be practicing and doing this and it takes a while for them to get their head around it they've got to learn a, a whole bunch of new phrases and new concepts but um, they can they can see where we're going with this and they like that yeah, yeah. Yes. so I know you're now quite familiar with the core principles in the switch being around chronic illness being related to the stress response the neurology of the thinking patterns, the beliefs, the lifestyle issues, um, and the deeper emotion issues from the past. Um, so what is your opinion on on that as a, um, a framework? Well, well, I've done quite a lot of research in the last five years on, on modern neuroscience. Um, and it seems to me that what you're doing is right in there with modern neuroscience. So don't, it's not, not a surprise to me how what you're doing and why you're effective. Because, mm. I mean, 
Now, this has been around now for this stuff has been around for about 30 years, especially the last 20 years, last 10 years, it's been starting to translate into clinical practice. Mm -hmm. So, um, things like functional neurological disorders, where people have strokes that are not, not strokes, but um, you know, symptoms that look like a stroke, but it's not a stroke, they might get a tremor that's not Parkinson's, they might have a, a seizure that's not an epileptic seizure. Mm -hmm. The neurologists who um, know about this stuff are basing their treatment on modern neurosciences, which is mm. really telling us how how we have sensations. Now, in the past, we didn't know that. We just thought the sensation, if you hurt your foot, you get a sensation from the foot up to your brain. Well, that is that is part of the case, but not the whole case. It turns out mm. that sensation is actually created by the nervous system. This is kind of a... Mm a mental switch that we have to go through in our own heads to understand that. But once you understand that, it's great because it it tells us why um, pain ha pain can persist when the central nervous system carries on doing this unnecessarily. It tells us why people can't walk when they haven't had a stroke, why they have a tremor that doesn't mm. make sense. So this So it's all about how the central nervous system at an unconscious level controls virtually everything in the body i mean we we think we can move our arm well we do move our arm that's voluntary but all the other functions in the body are involuntary mm -hmm. and um so yeah what i think you're doing is using some of those um principles from modern neuroscience to explain how the sympathetic nervous system works to protect yeah. the body from harm and then mm -hmm. if you kind of if you get your head around that you don't get into that vicious cycle of symptoms causing more anxiety, causing more symptoms, and ran you go in a circle. You don't mm -hmm. do that, right? So once you yeah. realize, oh, I don't have some terrible disease down my foot or my arm, or um, my brain is actually okay. Once you get a head around that, then that sympathetic nervous system sort of quietens down. Yeah. The parasympathetic nervous system kicks in, um, and so on. And just you mentioned emotions there. Well, emotions actually are interesting because. Um, like all other sensations, they're also generated by the central nervous system. And emotions mm. um, are also protective in a sense. I mean, if you're being attacked yeah. by a lion, it's probably quite good to get angry and, you know, yeah. buff, buff the lion in the face if you can possibly do that. So mm. emotions are similar to pain, really, even though it sounds funny to do this, but mm. they have a purpose. And so yeah. if you can figure out what's underneath those feelings and sensations then actually you've got a chance of um, switching off uh, the cns where it's been doing it overdoing it or inappropriately doing it or doing it in kind of the wrong context so you can you can you've got all that at your disposal once you figure this out mm. but this is this is kind of new stuff really if you if you look at this mm -hmm. um i mean we've kind of known this instinctively for some extent but now we have the science to back it up which is really really yeah. helpful so I'm excited as to where we're going with this. Not every doctor knows this. Um, mm. but lots of clinicians don't, haven't. I mean, you, you can't go and look into every new field that starts to develop as when you're a practicing physician. We've got just lots of patients to see. So you don't do yeah. this. So you depend on sort of, sort of review articles coming through and, and getting letters from specialists to say, this is the new science on this. So we depend on all that. Yeah. And on conferences, and I know, you know, whenever I've presented at the National GP conferences, you know, people are wildly keen to hear about it. There's a lot of positivity to hear these mind-body approaches. Yeah, there is. Although I have to say hearing about it is not the same as learning how to do it. Learning mm. how to do this, you need specific coaching. You need yeah. to actually, it's like you can't learn golf by watching Tiger Woods play golf. You have to go out no. and practice, hit, hit the ball yourself and then get a coach and all that sort of stuff. So it's the same with us teaching medical students where, um, you know, we, we, we're getting them to use the phrases and to use the, use yeah. the science, um, and then they can start to become proficient. Totally. Um, yeah, I mean, everything you say links in so well with the principles that that I've been teaching my clients. So I guess because we've looked at the research and what what's coming through, what, where do we need to be moving? So... Um, interestingly, one of the the big criticisms that I keep seeing showing up on in support group pages and and other societies and so on, um, a criticism of NLP and of the switch is that it's all pseudoscience. What's your opinion on that? 
Well, yeah. I mean, I, I think people just have to look at the science that's coming through. I mean, there's, it's all out there. I mean, you just, mm. you know, put in um, modern neuroscience and on Google, you get heaps of stuff. And, and I've done the Google Scholar stuff and I've looked at the videos and I've interviewed people and I've, in our research, I've been interviewing pain specialists and neurologists and stuff and people. And, and they're, they're, um, there's no pseudoscience about what they're doing. This is this is what mm. they're doing. I mean, it's, it's very solid. So, um, yeah, I mean, it takes a while for so, the, yeah, the lab science to get into clinical practice. I suppose the mm. phrase for that would be translational science into practice. So you have the lab science and you've got the case reports you know, uh, an, an individual patient did really well. So why was why was that? Do we, we need to explore why one patient might do well and then you might progress to, um, you know, more patients and you get more clinical practice experience. And then, I mean, I mean, it takes a while for um, sciences mm. to, get, to get, and it's not just randomised controlled trials. Randomised controlled trials is kind of the last point. But if you yeah. think... If you, I'm trying to think of an analogy. If you think of the association between smoking and cancer, lung cancer, for example, mm. I mean, what sort of randomized controlled trial are you going to do to prove that? Well, you, you can't really. <laughs> no. gonna, so, so there's a lot of um, clinical practice that's not actually based on randomized controlled trials, even though that is the gold mm. standard. Mm. So you've got you've got cohort studies and lots of other ways of um, trying to find evidence, and then you've got what happens in practice. Um, and practice, some people are usually ahead of the ball game in practice. Um, uh, and some some people um, take up these ideas early on. Mm. Um, so th th those people who take up the ideas early, it might be called early adopters, uh, early adopters of a new technology. And I perceive you and some other colleagues that I know to be early adopters of the stuff. Mm. But if you go back to something like Helicobacter, which is a, a bacteria that gets into the stomach, I mean, before we discovered Helicobacter, we thought every time someone had a stomachache, it was because of too much acid, right? So the mm. model was, you're stressed, you got too much acid, blah, blah, blah. But it didn't help those people who um, had Helicobacter infection in their stomach. And now we know it's, it's kind of a big switch. You know, these are fantastic new sciences coming through. And same with the neuroscience. Mm. It's, good, it's good science, but it takes a while to get into practice. So, yes, mm. the randomized controlled trials are the kind of last thing, but often practice yeah. changes before you get those randomized controlled right. trials in place. And actually, having said that, I've just been reviewing some uh, um, some PhDs um, myself and look very hard to to set up a randomized controlled trial when someone's already having treatment of another type. It's not that easy, mm. as it turns out, because you've also got, I mean, one way to do it might be that you have, people act as their own controls. They have kind of normal treatment for a year or so with their chronic pain mm. or something. And then they have uh, the new treatment and then you see, and but it's not that easy as it turns out. So so it's, I think it's simplistic to say there's no evidence. There is there is lots and mm. lots of very good evidence. Um, and um, and the, really the proofs and the pudding of people starting to get better um, with the treatment, well, then you've got to research why that is the case. Why, why do some people... Absolutely. Hmm. Yeah, and that, that was, you know, obviously another criticism that there's no randomised controlled trials of the switch, which you've already answered. That's quite a, a late stage. And also, you know, and that I collect and collect my own data because, you know, every client, I do health surveys before the course, two months after, one year after, and I collect that data. Um, to me, that's the first step of getting the evidence that there is change happening. And hopefully at some stage that will lead to larger trials. But in the meantime, is a treatment not valid if it hasn't reached those stages yet? Oh, no, I think treatment's valid if it's if it's um, proving effective. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't ever expect any treatment to be 100%, as I said. I just yeah. don't think you're not going to get that. I mean, in most of medicine, a lot of our treatments uh, might be 30, 40%, not much more above the, than placebo, mm. really. Mm. Um, so uh, placebo, um, you know, we know that, um, that placebo trials, 30% people will get better, get a 30% yes. reduction in, in their um, symptom rate or whatever. Mm. And so um, 
So if someone's, if someone's hitting 70%, 80%, well, something's going on. We need to look at that. We need to be scientists as to why is this person effective um, for someone who's been lurching away, doing not very well mm. for the last two years. Why is that the case? Well, we have to be quite mm. rigorous about how we might approach that. Mm. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert in translational science, but um, I know that a lot of the things we do in medicine, um, firstly, haven't been that well um, scientifically proven prior to being taken up. And then once they're taken up, it's almost unethical n- not to offer it to them. <laughs> you see what yeah. I mean? There's a lot of yeah. it's quite complex, really. But at, at a yeah. sense, one size doesn't fit all. You know, there's, there's no hard exactly. and fast. You're talking about a body of evidence as to as to why things why one why a practitioner is doing well. I would love there to be an RCT trial, um, and I've approached many researchers hoping that one day that will happen. But in the interim, it does seem like there are some good results happening. Well, um, two things you see, I I see the functional neurological disorders and the chronic pain as being the same, the same underlying mm-hmm. pathophysiology, which is disorders of perception. And in the um, in the functional neurological field, you've got some very good neurologists all around the world. John Stone, for example, who I met in 2013, he runs, a, he's sort of the leading person in this. He's basing his treatment on the modern um, neuroscience and and disorders of perception. But the the randomised controlled trials in that uh, there's only half a dozen of them. But yeah. that's that is now standard practice. Standard right, that's interesting. Practice. It's really interesting because I've looked, I've, mm. I've looked, I've, you know, I've dug under the horses and looked in the horse's mouth on this one, and mm. um, there's not a lot of great research, but that is a standard practice, and people are getting better with it. So, so you've got to think, well, mm. they're, onto, they're onto something. But that's where the theory, uh, neuroscience theory, is, you know, is, is mm. way over my way over my head, you know. But, but um, yeah. that's where it's going, and that's supported by. Um, clinical evidence and clinical experience and eventually mm. we'll get the randomized controlled trials with that. So for me, yeah. Mel, I mean, I, I'm not so, uh, I don't, you know, I'm not hanging around for a randomized controlled trial before I refer someone. I'm saying, mm. is this practitioner effective? Um, yeah. And yes, that's where I'll do the referrals. But I mean, I, mm. I'm, you know, I've looked in the, in the neurology, neurology stuff quite deeply now. And it's, I think it's fantastic because people mm. who, you know, suddenly get paralyzed um, and they can't walk um, with, a, with two or three good consultations, they're up again, you know, they're going great. Mm. Um, and that's functional neurological disorders. Um, yeah. Kind of, um, you know, it's no longer a mystery to us. It's great. I, I think it's, mm. yeah, so as I say, I'm enthusiastic about this because it takes us forward. Um, and uh, the modern neuroscience with, um, you know, neuroplasticity and the role of the CNS and creating symptoms and, and creating um, mm. sensations, I, I think it's um, it helps not just with these patients, but actually with all patients. It's it's um, it's a sort of a a um, a basic physiological understanding that we all need to have anyway. Mm. Totally, yeah, it's so important for that. Mm. Yeah, that basic understanding of why does someone get trapped in these long term illness patterns. It's so important. Mm. What about um, another? criticism is that um that if only 80 percent of people are getting great results that means 20 percent are going to feel more miserable because they didn't succeed um and therefore should we be recommending it um and also comments that it makes people worse which i am seeing no evidence of at all so i don't even know where that come comment comes from but if there were you know one or two people getting worse from a treatment does that mean that a treatment should not be offered when most people are getting good results well if you look at cancer for example i mean i mean would you say the same thing to a cancer um specialist you know i didn't get mm. better therefore the medications you gave me or the surgery you gave me was was incorrect. I mean, mm. no, you, you, that's not the case at all. Or heart disease. I mean, a lot of people have progressive heart disease, and they they don't even get. They might only get ten percent of people get better. <laughs> that's the opposite. Mm. So, so no, I think that's. Um, I'm not sure how to frame up that sort of criticism that you're facing, but but uh, yeah, I um, I mean, I I don't know. I'm not sure what to say about that other than. 
to say, well, look, um, 80% is really, really good. <laughs> Any treatment with 80% mm -hmm. is fantastic. And yes, yeah, sure, some people, um, there is no treatment that does 100%. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, no, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, that sort of uh, comment, because it's, it's, um, it's, I guess it's coming from a negative space as opposed to a, an open mm. inquiring space. Yeah. Yeah, it, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me because uh, I don't feel there's any treatment out there in the whole world that gets 100% success and that, you know, even if, you know, the mainstream treatments, there are some people that will get worse from them, but if the majority of people are getting positive results, those treatments stay in the market. Mm. Mm. That's right. So what sort of people do you think doctors um, should be referring to the switch? Oh, anyone with a chronic illness, I think. Um, mm. I don't think it matters too much. I mean, the, the sort of the so historically unexplained symptoms are, are good ones. Mm. But, but I, I imagine you'll have some good success with um, anyone with um, ongoing symptoms because... Mm. Even if you have a kind of a structural problem like multiple sclerosis or whatever, you know, there's a structural problem there. You've still got to have some other symptoms on top of that as well. Um, so general mm. well-being could be remarkably improved. But, but you know, the, I mm. mean, I imagine, you know, the, well, you get a lot of referrals for chronic fatigue or long COVID or you mm. know, chronic headaches or anxiety and depression and stuff like that. And I, I, I think all those things would, respond well to what you're doing mm. and i've seen good results with ms as well oh, so okay. yeah. not for people who are already in the sort of really you know wheelchair bound state not so much but people who've been in the stage of needing an electric leg stimulator to walk or needing a walking stick some of those people have got some very good results so it may well be that those patients have a, have a bit of fnd on top of their Part, mm. on top of them which is can be quite hard to sort out but the good neurologists can sort that out mm. but i mean um one of my colleagues is an orthopedic surgeon here and and he has people with um you know um say a bad hip pain but once you've sorted out the extra bit on top of the hip pain then they're back to just the hip pain if you see what i mean yeah. So this yeah. uh, on top of the, on top of the, the structural problem, the organic problem, the disease problem, the mm. you know the disease pathology. You can get the other bits, and I, and I, I think that's probably true for a, pretty much all all illnesses to some mm. extent. So, you know, and and the emotional layer, like if if you go to your doctor and find out that you have multiple sclerosis, I mean, how much anxiety is that going to throw you into, and you know how much grief. Um, you know, fear of the future, imagining yourself, I'll be in a wheelchair soon, I won't be able to do this or that. Like there's a lot of emotional layers that happen as a result of being given an, a terrifying diagnosis. So even when people can learn to approach those, um, that information in a different way, that can reduce symptoms because it oh, calms the stress response. Absolutely, yeah. There's that, there's that vicious cycle again, mm. getting kicked in. Totally. Um, yeah. Yeah. When do you think it's not a good idea to refer people to the switch? Um, well, I suppose some people um, may not be ready for a you know a personal development program. Um, yeah. I mean, some people with with you know who have got ongoing litigation against ACC or whatever you know in their ongoing battle, they may not be. You know, they've got other issues they're facing rather than, you know. Um, so I think mm. it's it's tricky. I mean, um, I'd hate to say no to anyone, but people have to be ready to do the work, in my understanding. Yeah. 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 So, if I mean, you can you can probably you can tell that sometimes how people talk about their illness. This thing happened to me because someone else did something else. That sort mm. of situation can be you'd have to un untangle all that sort of stuff. Well, I, I agree with what you say. People definitely have to be ready and they have to be willing to do the work. Um, and, yeah, also, I guess um, I check out what has your doctor said, like particularly with chronic pain, you know, if they say something like, oh, they've done scans and they can't really see why I'm in so much pain, you go, right, that's a great setting to come to the switch um, because they've taken the steps to eliminate some kind of 
physical situation that does need mainstream intervention. So yeah. I guess, yeah. you know, that's, and I noticed that in your um, manual for the students is first of all, check if there is some physical thing that needs addressing um, and then look into these sorts of options. So I guess that is one of my questions to people. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you'd, if someone's got a new pain and it's a, a new pattern of illness, you know, you're not the right person straight up. We have to do mm. our job properly. Yeah, um, exactly. I guess where I'm going with this is our doing our job properly means you're making a positive diagnosis of a, a persistent somatic symptom or what you might call the um, disorders of perception. To make a mm. positive diagnosis of that in the first consultation is where we're heading to. So if someone comes in with a, yeah. a tummy ache um, and um, there's patterns uh, patterns around that sort of illness that say this is not going to be appendicitis. Mm. You know, you've got you've got positive physical signs. You've got you don't have the fever and the temperature and the pinpoint tenderness yeah. and bloody all that sort of stuff. So we have to do, be doing our job properly, which is a really yeah. good understanding of biomedical principles and practice and totally and knowing the rare things. Um, yeah. and, and 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 but over time the good thing about being a gp over time is you get to to do a lot of pattern recognition and you recognize oh this is this is not going to be a, a horrible heart disease this is going to be one of these functional syndromes where yeah. um, people get dizzy and bloody blah you know so mm. so I, I, yeah. if you can nip that in the bud as a gp you, you do have a great service because you don't end up doing mm -hmm. a gazillion tests and going down mm -hmm. what they call specialty ping pong, you know, going from uh, one specialist to another. Don't do that, you know. Yeah. If, the, if your pattern is right and you've got positive clinical signs, you've got no negative physical signs, and you got and and sometimes you might have to do a, a test and that's it comes back negative. Then you're a strong ground. You're making a positive diagnosis. That's the whole mm -hmm. thing in neurology now is making a positive diagnosis of FND. Really, yeah. really, really helpful. It's not a diagnosis of exclusion any mm -hmm. longer. That's what I, what I like about going with this. And there's so many really good clinical signs in neurology now that you yeah. can be positive and confident about that. And the same with mm. complex regional pain syndrome. I mean, it sticks. It stands mm. up in your porridge, really. That it's so it's pretty obvious. Um, mm. A lot of my, you know, our colleagues. I didn't know much about that ten years ago, but I do now. But a lot mm. of our colleagues think that's well. That's really weird. How how has that person got this thing? Their ankle fractures healed up long ago. You know, but now we, mm. we know we know this cri diagnostic criteria. So it's really positive mm. now. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it seems from what I hear, um, complex regional pain syndrome is the worst pain for people to experience. But my experience has been it's one of the fastest pains to fix, possibly because it is so localized rather than something like fibro that's, you know, sort of quite s systemic. But and possibly also because a lot of the people I see with Crips are young people and children tend to respond very fast to these treatments uh, but yeah. i've seen adults with crips who've done very well too but um yeah crips has been one that's responded very fast it's fascinating that isn't it because i think um yeah it is one of the worst pains mm. um, completely debilitating absolutely horrible but yeah it's great mm -hmm. that you're getting a, a can get a, a reasonably quick result and may, maybe that for some reason the um the central sensitization is more accessible I mean, it's, it comes out. It's really obvious that you got central sensitization caused the swelling and the and the weakness mm. and the allodynia and the sensitivity. So it's really obvious. But so I don't know why that links why it should be so so readily amenable to treatment. But maybe it's I don't know. I'm, I haven't. I don't understand that at the moment. But I think it's great. Mm. Because yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. Really it's a great one to work with. It's very satisfying. <laughs> Absolutely, fantastic. <laughs> So what would you say to doctors or societies who are not yet showing openness to these sorts of approaches? Well, you've got to be, you know, I didn't know about this for a while. I mean, um, I don't know much about you know, modern advances in, in cardiology and, you know, this hasn't been my area of interest. So, but uh, doctors, you know, that we we us GPs, we we do every everybody's system, so we're not we, don't, we mm. can't keep up all the time. Um, 
But I, I think um, I, I, I think just be open to it. If a patient comes back from someone and they got better, um, well, I want to know what they, mm. what, you know, that's, oh, that's great. How did that work? But, yeah. I, you know, so some people will say, well, you mean you got better and your, their treatment worked and mine didn't. They feel a bit, maybe they feel a bit defensive about it. I don't know. But mm. I mean, it, take, it takes a while for populations of doctors to get the new ideas. And so, you know, Helicobacter wasn't necessarily accepted straight away. Um, mm. um, um, you know, the antiviral drugs that came in for he treating hep hepatitis um, C and HIV, they've been brilliant. That wasn't, they weren't mm. accepted generally straight away. So, so it takes a while, I think, but I mean, it's got to wait for people to catch up. And But what I'm trying mm. to do is give the, the students, the next generation, these tools. And so they go through and they, they're, they're you know, in some hospital somewhere and the, the doctor may not have heard about this stuff. And they can say, well, look, oh, I've heard of, I've, with this new stuff we've heard about in medical school and then see if the doctors are open to it. And, you know, they mm. can give them they can give them our manual that we've developed. <laughs> they can do that, you know. So, you know, there's lots, there's ways of happening, but it does happen. It take might take a generation, but it does happen. You know, it takes time. Mm. We've got to be, we've got so, to be gentle with our colleagues. You know, yeah, they're doing the, they're yeah, doing the it's best. Quite a big shift. They're doing the best they can, but I mean, modern neuroscience is, it's a, what's the phrase for it? You know, it is a, it's, it's a, you got to bend your head around backwards to get your head around it initially. You got to do mm. a, a mental flip. Well, that's hard for people to do a mental flip mm. so where do you like you talked about the next generation what's your vision of where we will be in another generation's time with um with this stuff and med and western medicine well firstly the phrase medically unexplained symptoms is deleted from the from the textbook right so there is no such yeah. thing anymore these <laughs> these illnesses are completely legitimate and they stand alongside any other illness like you know heart disease or degenerative yeah. diseases or cancerous diseases or you know yeah so, so that's to become normal so my i'd like the students to approach any patient and they've got a bunch of possibilities in their mind and one of them mm. is um disorders of perception and and they mm. So not everyone knows this phrase, disorders of perception, but it's, that's where I've dug down to. Um, they might call it, um, you know, a functional neurological disorder, which is now accepted term. Um, they might use old, slightly more old-fashioned labels like somatization or whatever. Um, mm. but, I mean, that's part part and part of parcel of their of their um, you know their their knowledge and skills is to identify it. Make a positive diagnosis, have an explanation for it, mm. follow up, engage with the patient, and also we haven't talked about this as yet, but getting past the stigma. What I'd mm. like to see is these illnesses not be associated with stigma and bias, and that's yeah. been a terrible, terrible thing for these yeah. patients that, that mm. they're, they're somehow blamed for having the illness. I mean, the chronic fatigue people yeah. have had a terrible time, and I really mm. um, feel for them that for a long time they mm. weren't validated as having a real illness. Well, they clearly yeah. do, and they yeah. have health care costs that are huge. So so yeah. um, I've been really um, supportive of them to say that, yes, this is a legitimate disease and it's not your fault. Yeah. Um, and yet it was triggered off by something or other. But the bias and stigma that they've had has endured has been horrible. Mm. So so mm. Um, I think it's great now there's treatments for that. The same thing with COVID yeah. coming in a bit, you know, long COVID. Um, some people um, have funny ideas about long COVID that, you know, for whatever reason, you contributed to it yourself in some way. But, but mm. hopefully the long COVID experience helps um, – I validate and endorse the, the chronic fatigue experience. Doesn't matter mm. which trigger it is, if it's a yeah. head, inj head injury or an illness or a, you know whatever. I saw a person with um, chronic fatigue after they developed cancer. You know, um, mm. it's just a real you know double whammy. Totally, but it makes okay. sense though, doesn't it? Because it's terrifying to get a cancer diagnosis, and if your body is way into the stress response like that then it's going to drain a lot of other um, organs oh, and yeah. systems in your body. The way I think about that now is that you've got a pain system, right? 
And so chronic pain is a disorder of the pain system, but you've also got a an energy system or, or a fatigue system. And fatigue is a very helpful device to give you a rest when your body's tired. So you can just as easily get a disorder of the fatigue system as you can get a disorder of the pain system. Yeah. And once you've got that, well, the central nervous system is driving that and, and any little trigger can trigger mm. it off. So so that's, to me, it's not, not a mystery anymore. Whereas I first went into clinical practice, I thought I couldn't understand that. You know, you do blood tests and mm. thyroid tests and bloody blood and... But no, it's a disorder of the fatigue system and yeah, disorder of the pain system, disorder of the motor system. That's mm. all unconsciously controlled by the central nervous system. So I'm, I'm yeah, I'm excited by it because they're no longer a mystery and people can get better and that's no longer a mystery mm. either. I'd love every GP practice to have doctors, nurses and naturopaths, acupuncture, mind body practitioners like that you know there's all these services all linking together because you know then we could all be referring to each other because we can see what we can do to help and where someone else's help is also needed and you know do you think yeah. that's something that could would ever end up you know the sort of the mainstream approach to modern gp practice well i think it's helpful to have a multidisciplinary approach um uh, I think you all need to be also singing from the same hymn sheet, though. So you're going to have a physiotherapist with, with chronic pain, yeah. for example, who's specifically trained in chronic pain, and they have a physiotherapist mm. with FND who's specifically trained in rehab for people with um, functional neurological disorders. Mm. But they're they're on the same page with it. But I also think that um, sometimes it takes two or three explanations, different explanations for people to kind of get it. Right. Mm. So the chronic pain um, clinics or persistent pain clinics, they have a lot of staff there and they've all, just, all mm. got their own spiel or, you know, their own patter. And so a patient might, might see four or five of them. Eventually, they might figure it out for themselves. Right. But yeah. Just just me as a GP on my own. I've only got one explanation. Mm. So having a lot of people sing from the same hymn sheet, really helpful. Yeah. So that's partly how I think the um, the persistent pain clinics that can be effective is a mm. sort of multi multi voice kind of education program, mm. not just one person. Totally, because there's all different ideas that we all contribute that yeah. are like pieces of the puzzle that all go together to create the the ultimate um, win for somebody. Yeah, yeah, and you've got to see you know see people where they are i mean it's it can be um it can be i guess it can be scary to think you've had mm. this illness for a long time and getting better might be scary for people they get it can be you know get into yep. that sort of routine of it and and it's it yeah so it's not that you've got to be respectful it's not that easy for people no no and that's part of the preparation before people come to the switch it doesn't start on day one of the course there's a lot that happens before that yeah. to make yeah. sure that people are actually in the best headspace to make the change yeah. so yeah lots of factors to address mm. um last question for me what opportunities do you see for a way forward for a research path for the switch um, and nlp in the future well, I, I think it's, it would be possible to do. Um, you, you need some funding and you need, I mean, it's hard for um, the practitioner to do their own research on their own stuff. It's hard. It's not yeah. very easy. So you need um, some independent funding. You've certainly got to pay those people. So, um, Well, if you hear of any students that need a good topic, you can make a suggestion on my behalf because I'm certainly open to this being researched. I've, you know, I'd love to see the, you know, the verification through studies by someone independent that this is having yeah. a good impact. But it's just very hard as an individual. I've approached many researchers. You don't, you know, don't get callbacks and then somehow, you know, I get blamed as being, you know, lacking science because it's not research. Like, yeah, but how do you make that happen as just individual little one man business? So, yeah, but yeah. I'm certainly open to it. If you hear of anyone that wants a good <laughs> topic to study, well, that is a possibility. Yeah, um, I hadn't thought of that before to talking with you now that a PhD person 
always a possibility there, Mel. Um, but I <laughs> well, you I know where I am. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, you know, I I wouldn't be necessarily needing the validation of a randomized controlled trial to say that what you're doing is effective. I mean, you'd, what you're doing yeah. is effective clearly, and it's as I say, it's based on modern neuroscience. So. So um, you know, carry on doing it as far as I can see, you know, and, and you're providing a good service for people around the country, um, you know, so so it's great. Well, thank you very much. I've um, really enjoyed our chat. I always enjoy our chats. <laughs> but um, there's some really interesting examples that you shared today. So, yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Nice to chat.